All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm sure everyone's hungry. Uh, cool. So we've got a great session. We've got great panelists here. Uh, Ronak, Trove Experiences. You guys all experienced the amazing coffee yesterday. Uh, Dipanshu, Zapfresh. Uh, they run a meat home delivery company. Uh, Enara running a clean cosmetic brand, uh, vegan. So here's meat. There's no absolutely vegan. Bellora. Bellora Cosmetics, yes. And there's Deepak from Bombay Shaving Company, who's helping men get rid of their hair across the body. <laughs> cool. So let's, let's start, let's start uh, understanding what's been your journey, guys. Uh, each one of first, so firstly, D2C, what, what is it that really defines D2C? Like, you know, I've had conversations with some of you guys. Some of you guys say that it's about being, about selling digitally first. So some people say, okay, because I'm selling digitally, I'm a D2C brand. Some are like, no, I have the consumer data. That's what makes me a digital brand, a D2C brand. What, according to you, is D2C? What makes you guys a D2C brand? And just love to sort of start the conversation there, just by setting some basic context. So over to you, Dipanshu. So, uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, according to me, a D2C is where you own the supply chain of the product. And then from the source to the customer, there is that ownership which you deliver uh, with a sustained experience. So that's uh, uh, you know uh, a branded approach according to me. And with respect to distribution channel being online or offline, I think that's still questionable. Um, and one can argue on that, but uh, the experience should be uh, maximum in your hands as a brand, um, uh, whether it is distribution or supply chain. Uh, that's so it's basically what you're saying is what defines a D2C is when you control the end-to-end -end experience. Absolutely. In a way. Yes. Got it. Yes. And are your thoughts? So I think in most simplistic terms, like you said, D2C, it's direct to consumer. So wherever you can have a direct interaction with the consumer, understand what the consumer wants, craft experiences which are as per that consumer, take the insights and craft your products or adjust your products back. Then to me, my mind, it's D2C. I think saying it's online versus offline may not be correct. Okay. Largely, it gets said because offline, you don't get the data. Uh, but in online also, if your 70, 80% of your uh, you know, uh, revenue is coming from third-party channels where you have no access, you're pretty much in the same offline experience. So I think D2C has to be very clearly where you are directly interacting with the consumer, understanding, and that's the beauty of it, to adjust your business according to that or create brands according to that. Uh, so similar to what Dipanshu said. Yes, saying. of course. For you? Yeah. No, I think broadly, uh, I agree with Anaya and Dipanshu. Uh, it's your ability to control the entire supply chain end to end, where you manufacture, market, sell, uh, ship, and then uh, customer service is the end goal where you engage with the consumer and take the feedback uh, back to the business. I've also spent like close to a decade in a large FMCG. Uh, I think most of the time, uh, you always felt that you are so far away from the consumer, right? And now you are so close to the consumer that you know how many consumers are right now looking to buy your brand on your site. You are like, uh, like you are tracking them every millisecond. Where are they clicking? Which ad set they are liking? Uh, which facet of your product on the screen they are kind of spending more time on, right? I think all this feedback then kind of goes into serving them better next time. I think, so in my view, I think D2C helps you personalize every consumer experience. That's very unlikely which large FMCGs have been doing for uh, many years in the past, right? So that's a that's a big learning or understanding for D2C from, from So for outside. you, it's yeah. the personalization of the sales process, yeah. if I may. 
or the marketing process. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone's covered it quite elaborately. <laughs> okay. But yeah, it, it need not be digital only, uh, although that's that's uh, the primary mode of uh, communicating and selling and everything today. It can be offline as well. I mean, yesterday we had the coffee session and I could get feedback from everyone at the after party during the session and that al allows us to kind of figure out what to do next or how do we tweak it. And so D2C is just basically having that consumer insight uh, directly and uh, being able to craft things accordingly. Awesome. So now let's talk a little bit about the, the pandemic. So pandemic changed a lot of things for businesses across the world. FMCGs were scratching their heads. D2C was like running the race. What's, what's been your experiences? What has, how has the pandemic changed your business? Has it accelerated things? Has it brought about new challenges? I'd love, you know, I'd love for each one of you guys to just share your experiences and any sort of takeaways that the audience can really you know, go back with, oh, I could use that insight. So if you could, you know. So um, it was a memorable experience, I should say, <laughs> because um, the first lockdown we were hit by, you know, everything was like um, um, extremely, you know, uh, blocked because there was a hoarding happening. We are a part of essentials. So we were operating and uh, it, since it was online, so everything connected and resonated and we saw cancellations, I think, worth 50 lakhs in three days. Um, and our system choked completely. So um, there was this mad rush and panic, of course, which was there. But over the period of time, it you know get you know, it got you know settled, and then the second lockdown, of course, was not that great, uh, where people were you know people understood you know how to balance their you know uh, buying uh, you know from where do they buy and everything. Um, and then I think overall in the last one year, if I have to sum up, um, you know, it will be that we have seen the offline to online shift, um, the acceptance of uh, online as a channel has grown massively. We've seen almost 3x growth overall uh, in the online uh, sales. So sales have improved, but um, other than sales, I think uh, what we I'm very happy about is the profitability where our marketing cost has gone down. So That's that organic shift is happening and helping us to you know create a little more pull rather than push. Um, so that's something which uh, we, we've experienced. That's interesting. And Ara, for you, what's, what's your been, how has pandemic impacted cosmetics? So I think as an entrepreneur, when you get into, you start any journey, you know that you know very little. Um, if anything, this pandemic taught us that you know nothing actually. So when we started, uh, one, we launched in January, we launched Clean Makeup Brand. Uh, our launch got deferred slightly because of the pandemic. By the time we launched, we thought it's makeup, people are sitting at home, who's going to buy makeup? So we ordered very less supply chain. Little did we know that people are sitting, it's a gloomy environment, 400 rupees lipstick will bring joy. So on one side, we saw a surge in demand, which was very crazy. Two, I think pandemic brought a certain, um, you know, uh, certain sort of uh, enlightenment or move towards healthy products. And ours is a clean makeup. So I think that suddenly took off on its own leg. On supply chain, our R&D is in Paris. Our products get certified in Australia. They get manufactured across the world. One country would start, other would close. China would create the packages. They had to go for the product filling in Germany. It would stop. By the time Germany would start, India would stop. It was havoc. So. Thankfully, we learned very early in our um, journey that you need to have backups of backups. To some extent, we had, but through this journey, we realized you need to have a lot more backup. Second thing we realized is the entire world moved to D2C, uh, but the world wasn't ready. So I think, how do you create experiences if the big brands have also started focusing, who were getting 15% from D2C, suddenly this became 100%. You can't win the race by advertising more than them. They have more cash flow. So how do you create experiences? How do you create products that are far more kick-ass? And how do you communicate in a far more kick-ass way to stand out? So I think those two things that how do you craft experiences and products to stand out and how do you create backups? Um, two things we learn. Hiring, we're still learning. I think like any other startup, hiring is a challenge, will continue to be. <laughs> well, yeah, talk about hiring. I think that, was, that should be a subject, tech hiring and how to fight that problem. But anyway, that for a separate uh, event. I think it was a very, uh, very surreal experience. What I have learned for the last 20 years is less than what I learned in the last seven, eight months. But it's been good. So basically, stay nimble. It's like You have to keep adapting, keep changing. Very, cool. very fast. Awesome. 
Uh, for you? No, I think for us, uh, like everybody, it made us rethink on a lot of things. Uh, uh, I think I will kind of briefly touch upon all the legs of that. Uh, one is consumer. Uh, we realize that I think our consumer preferences, at least during the pandemic period, were evolving, right? There was a lot of do-it-yourself stuff that was coming up. So how as a brand, we kind of uh, offer them it fast uh, and also kind of become part of their journey in doing it right, right? Uh, second is we we also innovated a lot, lot of con because we, we, are, we are a shaving company, a lot of women consumers uh, search for women razors, uh, women trimmers on our website, right? So uh, we we launch our women hair removal line th th at the peak of the pandemic, and now we have 15 products in that range. So it's opened a new business avenue for us, just because I think consumers kind of spoke to us and uh, came to us, and we are building on it. So, so I think just to complete your point from earlier, that's the digital touch point, which yes. gave you the feedback loop, which gave you a new product. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, and second is, uh, I think on the business, I think also it made business more agile and frugal. Uh, I will say it made us kind of rethink a lot of processes, strategies which we were executing, and we want to now. Even now, I think the pandemic kind of is, is it, uh, touch wood is will kind of stay and get things get better. Uh, I think we'll kind of continue with a lot of those things which we learned. Third is, I think tech, uh, innovation. Uh, we realize that uh, you, the consumer is fast evolving. You continue to kind of innovate, uh, but you need to be closer to the consumer. I think uh, we have innovation uh, pipeline and also kind of accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, I think the fourth theme is our own people, uh, because I think everybody went through something during pandemic. A uh, lot of stuff was happening here by right. So as a, as a company, I think we have kind of more closer together while people were working from uh, etc. I think the level of empathy around has gone up, I think, which kind of help us to serve our consumers better. So I think these are the four things broadly that That's awesome. Us. Yeah. That's awesome. What about you, Ranak? Yeah, so... Uh, How did the pandemic change you? Because it's all about real life experiences. Yes. Now suddenly... I, I think the biggest learning was uh, how can you be flexible, um, um, you know, the, the company was started with uh, a deep sense of passion for real-world physical experiences. Uh, started in November 2019, uh, oh. and within four months, we were hit with the pandemic. Uh, so, and we had to adapt to a virtual format. Uh, but thankfully, we realized kind of what are the, f the four key tenets of what we define as a good experience. Uh, you know, the artist, the storyteller that we're bringing on board has to be a certain caliber. Uh, the hands-on experience, the participative nature of the experience is key. Uh, the storytelling has to be done well and uh, the product that you're consuming has to be great. Um, so the, the three things were possible, but the hands-on nature of the experience is something which we were trying to figure out how do we replicate this virtually. Um, and we figured that, okay, can we still get people on a Zoom call, give them that little joy that you're talking about by sending them an experience hamper in advance of an experience. Uh, and with that, we were able to work with all our partners and figure out about 10 different experience formats and that's been going really well. Was, would you say that provided you more scale than the Absolutely. offline? Absolutely. So, uh, so I th you know, while the original vision was take people away from the screens that they're constantly glued to, we figured out now how to, you know, serve them even on a screen. Uh, and it's just opened up so many more avenues for us because scalability, first of all, like with physical experiences, you are limited to that city. Uh, now we're able to do experiences pan India. In fact, uh, we've done experiences pan global. Yeah. So earlier you you had to walk to the experience. Now the experience comes to you. Exactly. So yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So let's let's now switch gears. Let's go into okay. What platforms or do you want to sell direct through your own app or website? Do you prefer using e-commerce platforms offline? Talk a little bit about that. What are you, what have been your experiences? Like what works? best for your brand or vertical? So online, definitely. I mean, we, we are focusing more on mobile. Okay. And, uh, By mobile, you mean mobile mo web or web. app? Web, web and then app uh, and then uh, desktop. Okay. And, um, and then we have offline as well. So, but the primary focus and, and concentration has been on the mobile side. When you say offline, you mean stores? Yes, uh, retailers, supermarkets, yeah. um, going, you know, reaching directly to the customer at the touch point. Yeah. Uh, is something which uh, we've been doing. So um, both strategies are uh, equally important to us. So, and uh, 
Um, but but what we see, of course, after the pandemic, uh, people are preferring to be at home and you know order online more. So that inherently connects uh, very well with us. Got it. Uh, and Ara, for you, what so, what's your platform of choice? So I think uh, you know there is an interesting concept I was reading a few days back. It's about if you really want to win the consumer race, you need to be mentally and physically available. There is no choice. A brand needs to be. Uh, you know, mentally taking space and be very, very visible across all marketing platforms. And the product needs to be physically available everywhere the consumer sees. So if you see it across both distribution and marketing often enough, the chances of the brand winning the game is way higher. So I think going forward, we will be present all across. There is no choice per se. Mm. But when we are, since we are born, we right now a toddler who's learning to walk, it's been only seven, eight months. We were very clear that while it's easy to go win the game on e-commerce platforms where consumers are already coming, we want to win the game on D2C to understand that what the consumer is liking, where our products are concerned, what they're not liking, how do we change it. So we're quite obsessed with both our products and the consumer experience. And that is possible to understand that you're getting it right or not if your largest revenue channel is your own website, which is why we did that. Going forward, we are going to be across e-commerce, offline, and so forth. Got it. So you'd say first port of call is my own own and operated channel, and then Absolutely. I would depend Absolutely. on other channels to drive incremental Absolutely. sales. And we, we came from an industry where we felt that where mass premium consumers are concerned, mobile will be the first choice. Yeah. So the entire experiences that we've built are mobile first on the website. So Got M site. Got it. Awesome. What about you, Deepak? Uh, yeah, I, I believe, uh, I think online as a way of doing business will continue to grow. Uh, I think there's no doubt about it. It has happened, and especially in country like India, I think that's what China has gone through, where uh, the, the challenges with physical infrastructure are so high, I think technology breaks it. So online will continue to grow. Uh, I think India, India is on, on that path. But I believe still it's a long way to go only to win online. So I think brand has to be only channel. Uh, like Anaira said, you have to be present. Brand has to be present where consumer is, right? For example, we get a lot of orders from Kerala uh, for our grooming products. Uh, but the, the address that comes on that is uh, XY name and uh, XY street, right? So typically, you get 60% orders kind of come back because you're not able, the, the courier guy is not able to find the address and deliver. And that's the reality. Right? So how as a brand we solve it, obviously we given you can't have so many returns on the orders because your unit economies go for a toss. So then e-commerce become a way where you make sure that kind of uh, you fulfill the consumer service there or you get listed in uh, Pothis and Lulu supermarket in Cochin and Trivendram uh, where you are kind of still engaging with the consumer digitally but serving them uh, in the offline store. So I believe I think omni-channel is the way if you really want to build a 1,000, 5,000 crore brand, uh, and I think that's what we are doing right now. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, see, we're still a very young brand, and there's a lot to be tried. Uh, but so far, uh, what's worked work best for us is word of mouth, to be very honest. Uh, people come for the experiences, they love it, they go and recommend it to someone else. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the sales have been happening online. Uh, so website and Instagram are the primary channels uh, so far. B2B, again, has become a, a very important channel. Uh, corporate events and groups, uh, social groups coming to us. I mean, iMedia. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, that's that's worked very very well for us. Cool. So actually, Ronak touched upon an important subject, which is channels of marketing. So for you, Instagram is big. So I'd love to hear from each one of you guys. What is your go-to marketing channel? Right. What do you what 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 channel drives the most effective CAC for you? Let's talk about consumer acquisition. Let's talk about what channels work for you. So primarily, um, Instagram and the general standard social media, uh, you know, platforms do give us uh, reasonable, uh, you know, uh, you know, acquisition. Uh, but we generally get, you know, better, more sweeter results in offline, uh, where we do uh, sampling activities and touch points uh, near in the residential complexes and markets. So that creates a culmination of both offline and online, and and the customer is able to try the product and eventually buy it uh, later. So um, I really like that as a channel. Um, and uh, of course, um, online and offline is a mix of both we do. 
and more targeted uh, outreach, uh, both in online and offline, works pretty well. Um, largely with the uh, with the standard uh, you know platforms which are there, uh, we haven't okay. used much of uh, different affiliates to a large extent. So okay. we would love to do that. Uh, so in, in the, the you'd say you've. You've done the tried and test, so, so sampling, which is the offline marketing, yeah. is uh, something that works for you, and then social is sort of basic. Yes, yes. yes. But you, so there's still a lot more to explore. For yes, you absolutely. See, sampling uh, as a uh, as a strategy is very interesting. Um, in fact, you know there are a few new startups also uh, coming in the sampling space where you book an online sample and it comes to you, and then you try the product. So that is an experience, there is you know, the right amount of effort going in, um, ex and, and also the cost-wise, you, know, you are able to get the realization faster. Got it. But what about offline channels, like uh, you know, hoardings, TV, radio? Uh, I mean, uh, is we, any of, have you tried any of those? So or? we've tried, but I think this requires a little more uh, sustained um, you know, activity in order to get the right, right, you know, desired result over a period of time. So you've done it for, let's say, through three months, four months, but I think if you do it for at least minimum six months, then only you're able to realize that potential, yeah. uh, which exists in the mass media in the offline space. So Got it's it. expensive for, I think, young startups like us. Yeah. Um, so uh, we more, you know, look at more cost-effective performance. So more you know, digital led. first marketing than avenues as yes. opposed to offline yes. avenues. Yes, yes, absolutely. More performance-led. Yeah. Um, we, we like that uh, rather it. than uh, Got it. the other. So. Okay. If I can and just I, build on that, sorry. Yeah, please. I mean, all D2C brands uh, are heavily focused on performance because whatever you're investing, you have to see the ROI. Uh, and that's where I think even yesterday we were discussing, uh, even with programmatic or traditional media, you just don't see that ROI. Uh, and maybe that's not even the purpose of do marketing on those channels. Maybe it is more top funnel. Yeah. Uh, so I think until you reach a certain scale, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense for a, a young D2C brand. Uh, right. And that's because it, there's a core performance focus. Your founders are going to ask you, uh, <laughs> you know, kitna dala or kitna mila. <laughs> yeah, ROI ki hai. <laughs> Right. NRA for you? So since we're a beauty brand, uh, for a beauty brand, there are two things which would be very important. One, obviously, is performance, where recommendations come into play. So wherever like, we can find recommendation, whether it is social media, where women are talking about the product, whether it is referral programs, all those would tend to work for us from a performance standpoint. But I think if you, any brand has to win the game, especially in any lifestyle category, you need to start building the brand from day one. It may not give you the kind of uh, ROI that you're looking in a shorter term, but I think it multiplies in a longer term. If you, and for that purpose, I think digital won't be the only medium for us. We are already considering how do we get uh, you know, offline mix into the place? How can we look at autos in a far more experience-oriented way? Can we look at, we're just talking to somebody as the market opens, you know, the, this, there are hopefully no more waves. I think we've had a lot of waves. But if it doesn't happen, we are saying, can we look at doing some experiences for women to come together and experience our product? So for us, um, uh, brand building would be very key. For that, offline would be key. I think the kind of trust and visibility offline can get you, online can't get you even now. Mm. From a performance perspective, online would continue to play a very important piece. So. Offline for branding, but online for performance. Yeah, not so straight cut. <laughs> yeah, Both but I get, it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But yeah, yeah. Okay, got yeah, it. For offline also, performance uh, can be measured. It's difficult, but it can be managed. For yeah. example, in the sampling activities, what we do. Yeah. You know, the reason we do that and we like that is because it's performance-led. It's very you local, know? very, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you get the, the, the result right away, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's the reason. The performance, ROI-driven, uh, activities are going to be the, the top priority, whether it is offline, online or offline, Got I it. think. Got it. So whatever drives the most bang for buck. Yeah. So, you know, there was a, so just on a completely separate subject before we move to you, uh, at, at this event itself, about three or four years back, or actually five years back, there's a Dipali Nair who I'd met for the first time. She was CMO today, IBM, CMO at lots of large companies. And one of the biggest learnings I had from her, uh, and again, I'm st I was still young in marketing that time. I was still, as an ad tech entrepreneur, I'm learning a lot of, you know, what, how a marketer is thinking. And one of the biggest things I learned from her was that, okay, you can run a performance campaign, 
But as soon as you run a branding campaign along with the performance campaign, your performance goes off the roof, right? So I think looking at performance, standalone as performance, can nice be a little solution. myopic. Yeah. But like if you kind of put the two things together, you just get a lot more bang for buck. So just general, I'm not saying this is advice from me, this is advice from a veteran, but yeah. Just That's exactly what I said, that you know, branding requires a little more sustaining, yes. uh, yeah. sustainability. You yeah. know, if one has that kind of bandwidth, then it has to be done. You know, there's no two way about it. Yeah. But considering that, you know. But of course, uh, it depends on the life stage, the life cycle of the yes. company. That, that, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so the, the D2C brands largely are the newer guys we're talking about. Correct. You know, but they also have funded money, right? They, so. they do, but you know, uh, again, depends on how much money you have. So you would need to pick your, uh, you know, target guys accordingly. If you're pitching, you know, idea which is, you know, com you know, com combination of both, uh, and yeah, that's what I think. I think brand building starts from day one. Uh, if I have Couldn't five rupees, I would, even if it's very less, I would say I want to park two in brand building and three in performance. If it means I s even grow slower today. Uh, it's fine because I know two years down the line or one year down the line, it would multiply and there would be a different effect. I think it's also category to category and it's uh, founder to founder. Whether you want to build a great business or whether you want to build a great brand and business, I think it depends where you're slotting, which product, which category. Yeah, got it. What about you? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, I also kind of run the business. So to me, uh, I think apart from kind of driving traffic, uh, the quality of the traffic and uh, at, uh, the repeat from that traffic and then the frequency of that repeat is very important, right? So I, I think uh, investing in the marketing channels that help me achieve this over a uh, longer sustainable period, I think that's something we, we look for. So which channels work for you today? Uh, we, as we, a men's we, grooming category? As, as a brand, I, I don't know, like, I, I believe there will be few people in the room who would have got a Bombay shaving company kit gifted by somebody, right? Uh, so I think sampling is a big way of kind of, uh, because we believe that if somebody is gifting your brand, right, all, because you will not gift anything which you yourself will not have high trust, right? So, so I think sampling is a, is a big way to drive trials and word of mouth, but you just can't, for a young brand, I think just being dependent on sampling doesn't work, right? So uh, we use uh, Typical performance marketing platforms, you go to Facebook, Google, Insta Facebook, uh, Google, Google, okay. And, but I Big think influencer tech. is something I think we, we are realizing that now it's also, I think, getting very uh, cliche in terms of the way influencer marketing is also talk happening. About, but talk about that. So influencer marketing, does it drive, are you using it for branding or using it for performance, mixed bag? Uh, I think we do it for branding because uh, we believe they are, the, they are like-minded people it's same as cohort, right? So they're like-minded people who follow a particular celebrity or an influencer, and they want to hear from them what they like to buy, what they like to use, and what they say about them, right? So, but I think the, the thing that is important is, it again, it can't be looked from the performance lens. It can't be, I paid this money to an influencer for this campaign, he has posted there with these many swipe ups and engagement rate and got this much business, right? It has to be a long-term engagement, right? Because consumers are also getting smarter. Right, so they also know that like the same influencer will talk about ten other brands uh, over a period of six months, right? And maybe in the same category also, right? So uh, how do I kind of make sure I make influencer part of the brand and continuously make them talk about it for a longer period? I think is important. So uh, I think that's something uh, uh, is important. And I think last thing we were talking about yesterday is this entire ad tech thing. I think very interesting. It's as a brand we want to explore. But maybe I think very simplified version of that is something important to understand from the business lens. Uh, very early stages for us, but uh, I think I believe that I think uh, maybe th this becomes important. Uh, and I think yesterday we were having a chat uh, also in with, with few people from ad tech only. Uh, in terms of I think we'll still have maybe uh, we are in six years sixth year of our journey, right? Maybe. Two, three years down the line, we will also have 20-25% of our marketing spend going into traditional media. Uh, I think it's also important. We just can't completely ignore it. Okay. Got it. Ronak, for you? Yeah. So, like I said, I, the, I think you mentioned that earlier. So, we started channel that has been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, if you want to add But, yeah, it's Instagram and uh, social media have been, have been working well for us. Okay. Uh, and uh, the offline channel, of course. 
uh, going to brands directly or going to corporates directly Got has it. been working really well. Got but yeah, moving forward, social uh, and influencers specifically is going to be important. Uh, but like Deepak said, I think uh, you don't need just influencers, you need ambassadors who can continuously talk about the brand. Yeah. Because just like one impression is not going to do anything uh, Correct. Correct. from an ad serving standpoint, one impression from an influencer is not going to do anything. Got it. Uh, so if, if someone sees that, okay, this influencer is repeatedly talking about this brand over a year or two years, uh, that's when it'll create some impact and that's when they start thinking, okay, this person's an ambassador, not just an influencer. Got it. Uh, so that is a very, uh, you know, I think Sohail spoke yesterday about the creator economy and it's really booming. Uh, so how do you kind of be a part of that and, and leverage that? Got it. Interesting. So let's, let's switch gears now. So let's talk about uh, language, right? Lingual. Is that important for your brands? And are you guys looking at that as the next growth strategy? Like is going from, I'm assuming all of you have your websites in English and experiences in English. What about Hindi? What about, you know, all the other languages of the country? So I think in our case, um, it's not that relevant because um, ours is a, is a slightly aspirational customer which we're looking at who is English speaking and high income. So it's not uh, the target category. audience only. Yeah, so, uh, but otherwise, uh, I, I definitely believe that uh, vernacular is the way to go if the target audience is, is relevant to you. And if you may, maybe even go to two tier three cities, uh, that becomes relevant uh, for all the more. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, nothing there, at least okay. for us. For you, Enara, is it the same story? I think English, Hindi, Punjabi, Marathi, all those don't matter for us. We make up our language is audiovisual. If the colors are looking smashing, how the you know models are looking, how can I see those colors on myself? And I think that one of the things that we're solving is how can I use technology to help women see that how do the lipsticks look on them without ever visiting the store. So I think our focus is more towards uh, pictorial, visual sort of uh, language. Whatever you may want to write, if the color looks good on her, she's going to buy it. If it doesn't look good on, it's as simple as that. So I think all those are peripheral. Okay, okay. For oh, I think, shaving, uh, hair is a common problem for that, <laughs> no matter what language. So. I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> we, we've done some Hinglish. That English. has worked well uh, okay. with the young crowd. Okay. So that's still hep, according to me, a little. We do use some French since we're Belora Paris. Okay. Got it. Deepak, for no, you? I think for sure, I think vernacular is important. Uh, again, I think it goes back to, how, I think our country is so diverse. And, and I think it's also about when we, I think there was a topic about next 1 billion consumers. Uh, somebody talked about 1 million consumers, right? So uh, I don't think that even while there's a high purchasing power in the consumers sitting in tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 cities, but they may not be very conversant with using English as the only medium, right? So I've seen this, like somebody sitting in Barabanki in the central part of UP, right? Still want to uh, buy a premium shaving experience or grooming experience. Uh, and if I just, and as a brand, I think the owners in our category is to educate men uh, on the right way of uh, grooming, right? Because nobody has kind of, uh, and men doesn't talk to each other uh, a lot about what kya lagaya, what uh, lipstick lagaya. Like, like women. All, all yeah. Doesn't happen, right? Uh, so, so the onus is on brand a lot, right? But when onus is on the brand, you also have to talk the language of the consumer, right? And I believe that uh, among these 2 billion, 3 million, 10 million consumers, there are a lot who are your potential consumers but may not be able to engage with the brand because you're not communicating to them in their language. So does your and brand so vernacular is very important. So do you have a Hindi yeah. version of, okay, yeah. you do? So wow. in fact, yeah, we, we, we are also training our teams, customer service teams, et cetera, on different languages using some external help. That's interesting. Uh, even using regional influencers to kind of talk to the consumers. I believe, uh, again, I I think at, when you want to scale, uh, vernacular is very important uh, to connect with the consumer. Awesome. Ronak? Yeah, again, like the Panju said, uh, we're going after an aspirational audience, so English is usually English the is preferred the medium. But we've had requests from, uh, uh, I mean, in fact, we did one perfumery experience in the South, and we had a translator on the call to kind of translate things uh, for, for people, at least the key instructions. Uh, so if, there is an, if we see a growing need for that, we'll definitely be considering it. Got it. Awesome. 
Uh, I think we're pretty quickly approaching the end of the session. I just want to quickly understand, so the D2C space in India is booming. You know, I read a recent Your Story report which said that there's about over a thousand brands expected and big money behind it. A lot of money is being pumped in, into this whole sector. Uh, what is the game plan for each one of you guys? Like, you know, today, one of the big things that we're seeing is uh, D2C is eating FMCG for lunch. Will FMCG come back and eat D2C for dinner? So, like, eventually, his exit plans are sell to the big boys, uh, just keep scaling, stand independent. And I know that these journeys can change, but what's the status today for your brand? Good question. Very good question. So, I think um, as a brand owner, um, now there are two, three things. One is from a consumer side, where, where the evolution is going to be and what the behavior is going to turn up to. The other is from the stakeholder side, you know. So, I'll, I'll pick the first one first and then probably go to the next one. I think from a consumer standpoint, um, the larger guys, ITCs of the world have realized, you know, uh, that uh, there is no escape, uh, you know, from this and they have to get into the game too, to disrupt this. I still see some challenges there. Um, I don't think that they will be able to reach out the way we do sure. because uh, of the DNA. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe few, couple of guys may be able to get a little bit, but largely the landscape uh, will still be dominated by D2C and the right strategy for them, you know, could be to acquire young brands. Um, and we are seeing that activity happening where we are getting requests from yeah. all of these FMCG of players to, to, to get um, into the space via acquisitions and acquire hirings. Um, so I think that's the right way to do it if they want to do it because the DNA of, inherently of the company uh, will be too more traditional rather than more uh, tech-led. Uh, even if they try, uh, it just doesn't come very naturally to them. Got uh, it. So, yeah. so you think uh, D2C will stand the test of time and Absolutely. FM, it will become the new FMCG? Yes, I think we will see an array of brands which may be backed by FMCG players, but still, you know, running independently Got it. under the umbrella or under the backbone um, um, with this with these uh, larger players on on board. Got so it. the ecosystem uh, will become very interesting, according to me, because, um, for example, players like ITC or Jubilant Foods or other guys, they're all trying to now create a community of D2C brands uh, because yeah. they've realized that, they, as I said, that they can't really miss the bus and they have to get onto this. It's, it's going to be now uh, boiling down to the execution, the packaging and the presentation of how they structure this business. Um, and, and in my view, uh, the right way is, uh, is, is acquisition. So all these D2C brands um, probably may you know, uh, eventually look at selling out uh, to these larger guys. Um, that's, that's why all the VC uh, money, because there's got to be an exit play at some point. Yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's, the that's where the money is going to be. Got it. And Ara, for you, what's like your said, sort of roadmap, vision? of? Like I said, COVID has taught us one thing. We don't know anything. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, it's the most exciting time to be a founder, uh, whether it is access to capital, whether it is consumer behavior changing and getting uh, more and more uh, acceptable to reach out to consumers at a much lower cost than it was 10 years down the, you know, back. I think it's the fan it's fantastic time, but, and it would by default, if you have thousands of brands coming in the area, there is VC money, there is everything, there would be m and it is, it is crystal clear, I think, to everybody. But which brand, will, some brands will go and do IPO, some brands may go ahead and get acquired, some brands will merge. What will happen, we don't know. We're only driven with one thing. How can we, as a brand, create a, how can we create a brand where we're answering one question every day? How am I adding value to my customer? How am I adding more value to my customer, be it in creating product, be it in creating differentiated com experiences or communication? I think that's what our group, you know, path is. Where it would lead us, we have no idea. So you're staying nimble. You're like, whatever happens will happen. I want to satisfy the customer right now. That's the most We're important thing. We're obsessed with it. Obsessed with it. Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's definitely happened is the pandemic has created a tectonic shift across categories. Yeah. Like there's been an earthquake in all the buildings and structures have fallen, some have fallen, some, some are still standing, and a lot of recreation is happening overall, so. And how many shifts may happen, you never know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. No, I think there is, this is an exci exciting time to be an D2C entrepreneur. I believe we are just at a start. Uh, this thousand should be millions, right? Uh, because India has so many problems that can be solved through 
technology directly reaching out to consumers because of, I think, uh, challenges we all know about uh, the demographics, etc. right? Uh, but obviously, I think as a brand, uh, marketing is getting expensive and more and more brands are getting into D2C. <laughs> I can see, like, over the last five years, uh, uh, like, with every quarter, month, year, right, th things are getting expensive, complicated, right? So you need to find newer avenues to acquire consumer because everybody is vying for same consumer, uh, share of wallet, mind space, time, space, etc. right? So, but I think expanding consumer base is important. I think that's what all the brands like us are doing yeah. is we are kind of talking to them and expanding that consumer base itself who buys online, who have trust in now buying online. I think that's important. Second thing it is doing is also simplifying the ecosystem. I, like, now I'm now, right now I'm not worried about payment gateways or RTOs or uh, solving for my uh, uh, content creation, et cetera. I think there are a lot of uh, ecosystem companies that have come out so doing it for me, right? So now my only worry is how do I uh, make, give the best consumer experience through my products and uh, build the brand, right? So I think that's, that's helpful from the ecosystem point of view. Uh, to your question, I think, uh, I believe that the large brands and the D2C brands will coexist uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, uh, because I think large brands also realize that there's large consumer segments which are niche but untapped by them so far. So innovation have been accelerated for the consumer, I think. New categories have come about. Yeah, so large brands are now also trying to do that. So it will coexist, uh, beneficial for the consumer. So uh, yeah, we should be happy. Got consumer it. is the queen in the end. And for you? I, I think the pandemic has taught us that having five-year plans makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you need to innovate each day. Um, and, you know, no founder is going to claim that they eventually want to get acquired. I, I don't think anyone starts with that vision in mind. Um, uh, so the, the, the goal is, like, kind of keep adding value every day. And uh, Trove Experience specifically is bootstrapped. Um, I'm very passionate about this space. And, um, uh, you know, I hope that I can just keep doing this uh, until I have to retire, even if, if, I, if I ever have to. Uh, so, but, you know, there will be... Uh, to expand your consumer base at some point, you need to figure out how can you collaborate and uh, and do that. Okay. Uh, so whenever opportunities uh, present themselves, we will decide then and there. Yeah, stay nimble. Got it. All right, I'm going to wrap the session here uh, one with one last closing question. Will any of you accept crypto in the next six months as a form of payment? No. No. Uh, will any of you accept? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> will your brand accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment in the next six months? No. It depends. <laughs> okay. Next six months is, I think, early, but yeah, but you'd never know. Like everybody. Uh, that's why I limited the time uh, time frame, right? Next six months. Okay. You have to keep evolving with the customers. All right, cool. Well, any closing notes? Any insights that you would like? Any one of you guys would like to share before we wrap the session? No. Good. We're good. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope thank this was you, interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lavin. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, Lavin. Bye. Thank you so much, Lavin. Thank you so much to all of our panelists.